Result of the Tanjong Paga Division. Mr. Lam Tian, 760. Mr. Lee Kuan Yu, 6,029. <laughs> Mr. Lim Sek Tiong, 908. I declare Mr. Lee Kuan Yu elected for the Tanjong Paga Division. Saudara-saudara, saudari-saudari setanah air, merdeka! Lagi sekali yang bersemangat, merdeka! This morning, the new constitution was promulgated. We begin a new chapter in the history of Singapore. We, the people of Singapore, have decided to run the affairs of Singapore. Unlike the previous rulers, we have no compensation or abolition terms. Unlike the previous local ministers, we have no iron mines in Ipoh to provide for a rainy day. We have no personal future apart from your future. Your joys and your sorrows are ours. We share the same future, be it good, indifferent or bad. And so it is our duty to see that it is a bright and a cheerful future. A rise in the standard of living of our people cannot be created overnight. The good things of life do not fall down from the sky. They can only come by hard work over a long time. We have in our party men whose integrity and ability have been proved over the years in the struggle to build up the mass movement of the PAP. Their dedication to the cause of an independent, democratic, non-communist, socialist Malaya gives them the drive that will make the machinery of government work efficiently on your behalf. But all the planning and effort on the part of your government will not produce the desired results unless you, the people, will support and sustain the work of your government. We shall do our duty to our people, but our people must do their duty to themselves and their fellow citizens. Lastly, let it not be forgotten that we have been elected to govern on behalf of all the people of Singapore. The paramount interest is that of the people as a whole. There may be times when in the interest of the whole community, 
we may have to take steps which are unpopular with a section of the community. On such occasions, remember, the principle which guides our actions is that the paramount interest of the whole community must prevail. We never run away from a fight and never will. This is the only country we've got. And I say to them, they can chase out the British governors because they can all retire with good pensions in Britain. But they can't chase us out because we have nowhere to go and we will fight. So I say, over the next few weeks, as you see how things progress, remember this, the ultimate fight is between the communists and those who can put up a challenge, give them a run for their money. We know them, and I say this, without immodesty. We worked with them, that's why we know them. We know all their tactics, we understand the mechanics of the game, and we intend to ensure that the country survives. In August last year, right here, they were blaring with shouts and slogans, shouts and slogans, you know, as we were speaking, and we allowed them to speak. This is the communist. Well, I say to them, carry on. The open argument, the open debate. And I say, not we will win, but right, righteousness, and the interests of the people will triumph will triumph over evil and deceit, provided we are always united together. If we allow this kind of stupidity to ruin the country, then I say we deserve to perish. And I say it is your duty and mine to make sure it doesn't perish. We let it go on, doesn't do any harm, provided they don't take up stones and sticks and guns. But my last word of exhortation is, we have so much at stake. We have gone so far to secure the country. I say rally around and keep these evil forces. You see, they are so ashamed of themselves, they have switched the light off. Look at that. They are cowards, that's what they are. Cowards, they switch the lights off. Look at that. Are these men who are going to lead you to peace and prosperity or to ruination and perdition? Look at them. God knows what they are doing in the dark. When I say this, they succeed on the basis of intimidation. And I say, if they make the error that we are easily intimidated, then they have a lot to be sorry for. Because, you know, we have so much at stake, we can't afford to be intimidated.
stop it. First thing I did was check out the water. We increased the capacity at Tebrao from 30 million to 45 million. Increased the pumping. We entered into negotiations immediately for a new water agreement. They wanted 7 cents a thousand gallons. Yeah? 7 cents a thousand gallons, I had to see the Tumku. In 1961, 62, I had to see the Tumku. I said, look, this is not fair. So finally, Tumku says, well, now and since Sir Percy McNeese wrote a letter long ago to pay 3 cents per thousand gallons, you better pay 3 cents. So we had to pay 3 cents. And it was only after we signed an agreement that the pipeline started being laid. We did, not Mr. A.P. Raja. That's a fact, you know. I don't want, I mean, yeah. Whatever I say, I like to support with facts, documents. I never like to believe in the memory. Human memory is an elastic thing. Whenever it's unpleasant, you forget it. <laughs> My memory is on the magnetic tape. If whatever I say, if we forget, we can play back the tape. It's there on the record. And if I want to play an election start, I just switch on the water and forget all about this. And I say, look, win or lose, you've got to win or lose with a sane and a stable base. Otherwise, you can't govern this place. And I say, if I lose, I'm satisfied. Because nobody, no group of men have got the will, have got the capacity to do more for this country. I tell you that, friendly. To do more for themselves, yes. But you know, not put your whole heart into this and really fight it out. You know, I'll be quite frank with you. I mean, my colleagues, I'm proud of them. Uh, we are not, I'm not a one-man show. You see my picture everywhere. It makes it easier. You symbolize it in one man. You know? But don't believe it's a one-man show. Cannot be done. Without Dr. Go to run the finance thing, and an enormous amount of knowledge, you know, foresight analysis. In every department, there is talent. You know, Mr. Young gave up a lucrative job with the Overseas Assurance as their general manager. He's a graduate of Raffles College, executive talent. That is why today there is forward planning in the schools that teachers are coming out as fast as the schools and every boy is in school, and two years more, free secondary education. Malays, 43%. Malays, Dayaks, Dusun, Murus. Chinese, 41%. Indians, 10%. The others, Eurasians, Celanese, and so on. And I say we got to work with each other. No group can oppress the other. We work together. And you want Singapore to remain as it is, a sane, stable place. Vote a lot of stable people into office. The only symbol that didn't change over 10 years, the only party that stuck to its principles, truth, good times and bad times, never wavered. Why should Dr. Go spend money buying expensive equipment, training soldiers, sailors and airmen, when he's a thrifty soul? He was Defence Minister 65-67, to get it started. He is one of the most tough-minded, resolute and able administrators I've known. 
I said, you start it from nothing. It cost us billions. I just put down defense expenditure well, from 2 to 10 percent of GNP because no country gives you its defense expenditure. We, at the end of, let's say, 1980, when if there's trouble, now I don't think there'll be trouble for five years. I hope so, anyway. At the end of 1980, you press the button, you'll have three, well, let's be conservative, 250,000 armed forces. Whoever wants to take us on must have 750,000. That's quite a lot, you know. And we can afford this only by a national service army. And what do the opposition tell you? Abolish it. Have a regular army. You know, regular soldiers, so they get grow they go older and flabbier every year, you see. You can't Singapore can't maintain a hundred thousand man army, we'll go bankrupt. Having been trained two years he's out. Producing. Every year he practices, keeps in trim, learns how to roll, learns how to attack, how to duck. And I say, this is an investment. Not one that produces returns in interest, but one that produces an indirect interest, uh, return in your security and the confidence, not only of overseas investors, but of our own people. This is a real test for you, as well as for the Singapore government and the governments around the region and the superpowers, because we happen to be in a strategic position. I have never ceased to be amazed that at each election people can turn up, put their deposits down and try their luck. When a man puts down $1,500 to go down to Tanyong Paga, I ask myself now, what did he think I've been doing all these years? And it's not just for Tanjong Paga. It's not just new buildings, new jobs. It's the mechanics of getting people to follow your policy step by step and to be with you to adjust your policies so that you cause the minimum of upsets. Modify, modulate to lessen the discomfort of resettlement, give him more compensation, more solace, to let him restart life anew because new buildings have to go up where he used to stay. And it's the grassroots organization. You know, words. The opposition says, yes, they are grassroots too. But words convey a whole wealth of meaning which unless you've been through it, unless you've seen it, does not have that resonance, does not conjure up in your mind the real significance of what you mean by grass root. I don't have to go down to Craig Road or Duxton Road in my constituency every month, every week. I go there maybe once a year because I've been there 25 years 
and I have seen their successful children leave. And I meet them when I visit the new towns in Kim Seng, in Ang Mo Kyo. They were little children when I was campaigning in Craig Road. And this has been happening throughout Singapore. And we've buttoned up the ground and I make no apologies for it. Wherever you meet us as an opposition party, you are meeting an organized and an established outfit. We know who stays where, who they are, whether they are for, whether they are against us, whether they can be converted, persuaded, or whether it's a waste of time talking to them. It doesn't really matter whether the election is nine days or 19 days. The process of making up their minds had gone on every day since the last elections. Having such a quiet election means we win. That's why it's, it becomes even quieter. And if I were the opposition, let me give the, the first thing I would do is to make sure that the election is not a foregone conclusion. At least field 57, 58, not 38, make some effort. Lose a few deposits, doesn't matter. But you throw the election issue into doubt. But there's no doubts about this. On nomination day, they conceded that they couldn't find the candidates to take us on. It's as simple as that. Don't believe they haven't tried. Each one of them has tried. Dr. Lee Siu Cho, he never ceases to try. Don't believe Mr. Chiam hasn't tried. He's been running around trying to get candidates. He couldn't. The great issues that used to excite the population, race, language, religion, religion and culture, they have been diffused. They have been muted. They are latent. They are dormant. They are not dead. And as an old campaigner, Dr. Lee knows that. He doesn't cease to try. He tries. Whether it's English language and Mandarin, Mandarin versus dialect, he keeps on trying. There are great issues that used to agitate people because language means yourself, your personality. It also means your job, a living. And to have brought Singapore around to make a living without natural resources was a most delicate, a most intricate political trial and test of navigational skills so that eventually we got everybody by free choice to accept yes. We accept English as the working language and please I want to keep my mother tongue for my sense of identity. That's a major triumph. Possible only because we are a people with common sense. What does life depend on? A consensus, a social compact, a social contract 
between all of us who form one society that we shall make a joint collective efforts for our common good. And many societies have tried many ways to get the maximum benefit for the maximum number of people. And each has his own variation of certain basic formulas or formulae. And here we have an opposition still parroting these words. The Compassionate Society, free medical services, cheaper PUB bills, cheaper bus fares. Who pays? Who creates wealth? Look at the buildings around you. Look at the stock market. It's bouncing up. Let me tell you how to bring it down. <laughs> Have a couple of really good riots. Shake political confidence. You've got on the one hand the open free market system in America. You have on the other hand exact opposite the close control command economy of the Soviet Union, communist Russia. The Chinese tried the communist model with their own modifications and it's failed. And they have admitted that it's failed. And they are trying to pick up the same competitive spirit between workers, between different enterprises which they notice in Hong Kong. So they have opened a new town on the border with Hong Kong called Samchun. And they are inducing Hong Kong entrepreneurs to go and create employment. And Dr. Lee Siu Cho and Mr. Jaya Ratnam talk as if these things have never happened. They haven't learned. Deng Xiaoping is a great man. He fought a great revolution. He saw the product of that revolution turn sour. He was fortunate to live long enough and he had the courage to say, no, we change course. Let's learn. Let's stop trying to do everything by ourselves. So they started importing and buying Boeing 707s. So they bought Tridents instead of trying to manufacture their own aircraft. Eventually they will, but it will take two, maybe three generations. That's how we succeeded, because we have open minds, common sense. A lot of analysis careful weighing of the odds, make a firm decision, monitor it, implement it, modify as it goes wrong. Abandon if it is no good, but often, and I say this more out of relief than out of pride, often, eight times out of ten, we have been right. We've made mistakes. We put money in UPOC, in Jurong, second-hand machinery. We were young then. We were new in the game. They sold us second-hand machinery. We didn't know. We lost money. We wrote it off. But we learned. Mr. Jayaratnam says we are obsessed with profits. I said, yes. That's how Singapore survives. We have no profit who pays for all this. You make profit into a dirty word and Singapore dies. But believe you me, the fact that this education has gone on for 20 years doesn't mean that a new generation will automatically get that education. You have to transmit that knowledge. Human beings are not like computers. You know, you can take one computer bank, plug the terminals, 
and all the data from one computer bank can go into another. But human beings start with fresh minds. You get a newborn child, he grows up completely blank, input from parents, input from friends, input from teachers. But no input is as vivid, as long-lasting as his own experience. And because his experience is one of tranquility, of perpetual progress from an atap shed to a two-room flat, to a four-room flat, to a point-block flat, to a five-room flat, to an HUDC, into the private housing estates. So he believes that that is the natural cause of nature. It isn't so. You unscramble this. The confidence, the organization upon which Singapore thrives, and you had it. You can bring us down as quickly, if not quicker, than Sri Lanka or Jamaica. Don't believe that because you can change governments at election time, they are going to progress. You won't, you know. So when you cast your vote, remember, it's sacred because it's something you can't change until the next five years, by which time irreparable harm would have been done. And there's one crucial quality, political judgment and the ability to move a people. You can't move a people to go in the direction which your policies tell you you must go, it will fail. You've got to convince them. And for that, you need a whole multiplicity of instruments. The press, the television, the news conference, your grassroots organizations, your CCCs, your MCs, your residence committee, Constant explanation, constant feedback, constant adjustments, reformulation of policies. Now let me tell you what you have done with your money. I take the three-room flats. 72. 40,000 are owner-occupied. By 76, 80,000. By 80. 140,000, from 40 to 80 to 140. 140,000 house owners of three-room flats. Now let's take the four rooms. 2005 in 1972. 76, 20,000. Now, 80, 54,000. They have moved up. Let's take five room flats. 72, we went for elections. Zero. Nobody owned a point block flat. 76, 8,000. Today, 21,000. Let me give you the total of property-owning voters by families, just HDB and JTC, 230,000. I know the executives are complaining because they are getting their HUDC flat slowly. We'll sort that out. 1972-0. Nineteen seventy six, two hundred and fifty. This year, two thousand twenty. Come back here, nineteen eighty four, eighty five. We'll have it around six to seven thousand. 
color television sets. We went color in 1974. By 1976, we had 54,000 sets. This year, we have 210,000 sets. 210 out of 390 total sets. Licenses to SBC, more than half. Now the future. We'll make it. And we'll need no help from either Dr. Lee or Jai Ratnam or Mr. Chiang. They have not helped us do this. You have. I tell you what you have to do. You've got to get this young team. You've got to know them, they've got to know you, and you've got to gel and build on what we have built. All this will just go down. Your property will be worthless. You take away the stability, the regular cleansing, the tip-top servicing, water, lights, sanitation. We are the only city in the world where there's city cleansing, garbage removal every day in 365 days of the year. That's quite an achievement. And we've got to keep it that way. Or your green city and clean cities will smell, will stink. How do we make the next stage? And I say it's going to be more difficult. When we started, we had an, a hungry population. Now it isn't. Second, the next jump is a qualitative transformation. It's no longer just getting jobs. It's training people for highly skilled operations in which you use more technicians, more engineers than skilled workers, and more skilled workers than unskilled workers. So you move up. Everybody moves up from unskilled to semi-skilled, semi-skilled to skilled, skilled to technicians, technicians to supervisors, supervisors to engineers, engineers to managers, managers to directors. Quite an operation. It has to be done in 10, 15 years. That's why the university, the polytechnics, the whole education structure has become critical. The word is simple. It's called productivity. Productivity means the ability to use men and machines in such a cooperative way that you produce more products per man hour of a superior quality than any other person can do, any other group of can do. And that means cooperation, not antagonism. And that's what the younger team has to achieve. And after these elections, what I want to do, but which I will not complete, which the younger team must do, is to build up a relationship so that the workers, the supervisors, and the managers and directors are at one. They are looking after each other. They are looking after the company. I, I, I'll be too old by the 1990s, even by the late 80s, to want to go down to the factory floor and see for myself and get things right. Reading reports and seeing things for yourselves are two different things, you know. Watching it on TV is better, but it's not the same as seeing a man. I can tell you that when I met the SIA pilots, I didn't meet them on TV. I met them face to face, so five feet across the table so they can see me and see whether I'm still vigorous, 
able to campaign and take them on, whether it's worth taking me on. And I offered them two choices. Either you argue, you stop this intimidation, which is what it was, bringing SID, SIA right down, disrupting services, ruining its reputation, millions of dollars worth of advertisements and sales ruined within a matter of two weeks. I gave them a choice. Continue this, and I will, by every means at my disposal, teach you and get the people of Singapore, help me teach you a lesson you won't forget. And I'm prepared to start all over again. Or stop it. Get back to work. Restore discipline. Then argue your case. Took them 65 minutes. And they decided, okay, it isn't worth the fight. Why? Because they know they lose. They know that I'm prepared to ground the airline. They know that I can get the airline going again without them. And let there be no mistakes about this. Whoever governs Singapore must have that iron in him or give it up. This is not a game of cards. This is your life and mine. I've spent a whole lifetime building this. And as long as I'm in charge, nobody's going to knock it down.